tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. This episode of Drew Blood's Dark Tales is brought to you by HelloFresh. Happy holidays, friends. Say hello to a stressless holiday season this month with the help of HelloFresh. Skip the grocery store and save time with easy, tasty recipes delivered right to your door. With farm fresh, pre proportioned ingredients and seasonal recipes, you'll have everything you need to whip up fresh, tasty meals. Who's got time for shopping this month? Seriously. Count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable with America's number one meal kit. So go to HelloFresh.com slash DrewFree to use code DrewFree for free breakfast for life. One breakfast item per box while subscription is active. That's free breakfast for life at HelloFresh.com slash DrewFree with code DrewFree. D-R-E-W-F-R-E-E. -E. Welcome back, friends. Today is a very special day at Casa de Blood, and I appreciate you being here for it. It's National Lard Day, in which we gather together to celebrate the use of lard. Yes, that's really a thing, and no, you can't make this stuff up. Or you can just celebrate it like old Chester here, and eat a can of Crisco right out of the container. Lard ass. Well, come on in, friend. Hmm. All right. Tonight we welcome back our pal, Corey Adrian, author of the Bayou Blood series. So smoke them if you got them and drink those glasses to the bottom, y'all. Cause old Drew Blood has a tale to tell. But first, the ram. Oh, hey, I didn't see you there. You know, Drew Blood's Dark Tales is only one of the many shows on this network you could be listening to. We hope you'll subscribe to our entire lineup, including Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, Scary Stories Told in the Dark, Fear from the Heartland, and Horror Hill. All available on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. Also, visit simplyscarypodcast.com to become a patron. For as little as $5 a month, you get our entire catalog ad-free and available to download or stream. A bargain. And now, back to the show. In our tale tonight, we join an 18th century reenactment enthusiast whose immersion becomes a little too authentic. So without further delay, from author Corey Adrian, I give you Colonial Rift. Well, Mike, you ready? I asked. Hell yeah, I've been looking forward to this all year, Mike replied. Let's get this car loaded up and we'll head out. The luggage was plentiful. We had to play a game of Tetris to fit it all into my small SUV. There were tents, cast iron cookware sets, and not to mention several cookers full of food and drink for the weekend. Well, that's all she wrote. Let's hit the road, I said as I placed the last item into the vehicle and closed the hatch. I backed out of the driveway and started our journey to the state park. Upon arrival, I drove the vehicle out onto the field and rolled up as close to the camping area as we could get. The camping area was embedded amongst heavy woodland with various camping lots cleared out. Looks like we're the first people here, Mike said. Well, at least we get first pick for our camping spot, I stated. Mike and I proceeded to climb out of the car walked down the narrow trail to select our camp. We walked for a few minutes when I spotted a nice shady spot encompassed by large trees and old fire pit. 
and it was about ten feet or so from the main trail, just enough for it to feel somewhat secluded. I think this will be the spot, Mike, I said. Works for me. We walked back to our SUV and started to unload our gear. After several trips back and forth, the small SUV was unloaded, and we began to set up our individual canvas tents. A few hours passed by, and we finally had the camp fully set up. Hey, Mike, if you want to start on the fire, I'll take the car back to the parking area. Sounds good, man, Mike replied. I walked back to the car and drove it back out of the park and around the backside of a large metal building just outside the park entrance. The cars are supposed to be out of sight for all reenactment participants to give the illusion of full immersion into the 18th century. With the car now parked, I started my trek back to the campsite on foot. Arriving back at camp, Mike had a decently steady fire going and was in the process of setting up a couple of gridirons on which to cook our dinner. Well, what's it gonna be tonight? Chicken legs or pork chops? Mike asked. Hmm, let's do the chicken. I replied. Mike dug through the cooler and pulled out a pack of six chicken legs. The smell of the chicken roasting over the fire was heavenly. As the chicken was cooking, Mike brought out a tankard of his homemade mead. I grabbed my tin cup and held it out, allowing Mike to fill it to the brim. We drank and held conversation until the chicken was done. We feasted on the chicken and soon enough the dwindling light of dusk was upon us. Mike and I were finishing up our cups of mead as we watched fellow reenactors finish setting up camp. By the time the others had finished setting up, the only light around were from the moon, stars, and the small campfire before us. Well, I think I'm going to hit the sack, I told Mike. Probably a good idea, Mike replied. With that being said, I climbed into my tent, shut the flaps, and soon fell asleep. The morning came swiftly, opening my eyes to the shining sun and birdsong. I heard noises just outside of my tent. Slowly sitting up and stretching, I stood up and proceeded to put my colonial period outfit on. Brown breeches, wool gray stockings, buckled shoes, a white linen shirt, and a traditional tricorn hat. I stepped out of the tent and found Mike already cooking up breakfast consisting of bacon and eggs over the fire. Good morning, I said groggily. Morning, Mike replied. I noticed that my mouth was particularly dry, so I grabbed a bottle of water from the cooler. Ah, that's better, I stated after taking a long drink from the water bottle. I walked over to the fire, grabbing my wooden plate and two-pronged fork along the way. Good timing. Food's ready, Mike said. Awesome. I'm starving. I reached down and grabbed three strips of bacon and two sunny-side-up eggs. Well, today is going to be good, but tomorrow will be even better, Mike said. He was correct. Fridays at this reenactment were called education days. It is for the school-aged children to come and learn about life in the 18th century. Now, I have to tell you that in the center of this park, there's a fort with a period-correct cabin nestled inside. Mike and I were slated with teaching the kids how to properly harvest logs from the woodland as a living exhibit. To start, since it's a state park, we have to select trees that have already fallen to the ground. We cannot cut down fresh trees in order to preserve the natural forest around us. Mike and I ventured into the woodland where we found three or four trees on the ground which were suitable for log making. With a series of ropes and smaller roller branches, we dragged one tree back to the fort area. I then walked back to camp and retrieved various tools such as draw knives, adzes, axes, wooden mallets, and saws. Soon after returning with the tools, we heard the artillery cannon fire, signaling the opening of the fair. Slowly, groups of children and teachers were swarming each vendor and exhibit. Mike and I started prepping the first log for lumber harvesting. This was not easy work. It could take up to an hour to harvest only a few pieces of lumber from one log. I continued working on the log as Mike explained the history and the tools that I was using. After a couple of hours, it was lunch break, 
Mike and I paused our work and set up ropes so the children could not access our exhibit for safety reasons. We walked over to one of the many tents that sold period correct foods. We selected a tent that was selling green beans and turkey legs. While feasting on our lunch, we sat back in a small shady alcove away from the bustling school children. Mike knew considerably more than me about the immediate area. You know, this area was once inhabited by the Shawnee Native Americans. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I have a fair amount of Native American ancestry in my bloodline. Well, that's pretty cool, I replied. My father told me some stories about this area that he stumbled upon while researching our family history. He told me that our people found this land to have mystical properties. Oh, really? Like what? I asked while taking a large bite out of my turkey leg. Well, the Kespoko tribe, a sect of the Shawnee, stated they felt the power of the earth no matter where they were in these woodlands. They claimed that their crops always did well and that the water supply never dwindled. Well, that's pretty interesting. My father also told me that the Kespoko said that when they drank out of the spring, they felt stronger somehow. Now, the spring has been capped off in recent years, but it still produces fresh water, Mike added. They must have had a pretty decent life here then. Well, until the settlers showed up, that is. You see, the settlers had heard of this sacred land and wanted it for themselves to cultivate crops and establish a settlement. So when the settlers came, the natives were pushed out. The few who fought back were either taken prisoner or killed. Damn, there are a lot of things about history that absolutely disgust me, I replied. Yeah, well... There's not much we can do about it now. That's true. The rest of our lunch break, Mike and I sat in silence until we had finished our food. You ready to get back at it? As ready as I'll ever be. We walked back over to our exhibit and started harvesting more lumber. The remainder of the day went by fairly quickly. Mike and I took several alternating breaks and taught a few more lessons. Then, before we knew it, the closing of the day was soon upon us. Once the last of the school children were out of the park and the gates were closed, Mike and I started gathering our tools. We headed back to our campsite and put our tools away for the evening. The evenings during the fair consisted of a period-correct dinner. The gathering house was lit with a fire in the hearth and many beeswax candles. We feasted on foods left over from the day. The mead and beer flowed abundantly. Participants of the fair enjoyed this evening time up to 9 p.m., lights out time. After having had consumed copious amounts of beer and mead, Mike and I stumbled our way back to the camp. Upon arrival to camp, I pulled the last two bottles of water from the cooler and handed one to Mike. Thanks, man, Mike said while reaching for the bottle. No problem. We're going to need it, I said. Mike chuckled slightly and said goodnight and climbed into his tent. I was not extremely tired yet, so I rekindled the low-burning embers in the fire pit into a small fire. I sat by this fire listening to the crickets and the wind blowing through the trees. My mind soon flashed back to the story that Mike had told me, and I pondered on that for a while. I thought of the mystical energy surrounding these lands and felt a slight breeze come through the camp. I shuddered a bit due to the cool nature of the breeze. I then decided to stamp out the fire and turn in for the night. Sun bursting once again through the small gaps in my canvas tent. I awoke to the sound of conversation outside my tent. I once again dressed in full garb and exited my tent to greet the day. Mike and another fellow reenactor were talking near the fire. Morning, gents, I said as I crouched and warmed my hands by the fire. Good morning, Mike and the other gentlemen replied. What's on the menu this morning, Mike? I figured we'd go into the fair here and get a couple scotch eggs, Mike replied. Sounds good to me. The fellow reenactor, later come to be known as Charlie, bid his farewell as Mike and I started heading for the scotch egg booth. Scotch eggs are delicious. What is not to like better than a hard-boiled egg wrapped in pork sausage and fried, slathered with fresh-made stone-ground mustard? 
Mike and I received our eggs and sat on a bench near the booth to enjoy the delectable morsels of food. Upon finishing our food, we once again heard the artillery cannon blast. Well, here we go. Mike and I slowly stood up and started walking around the outer perimeter of the park, preparing for the onslaught of visitors for the day. For the two days remaining at the fair, I was selected to be an actor in a ball of deer. Mike was an actor. We both had to immerse ourselves in the language and actions of someone in the 18th century. We walked up to one of the many taverns to fill our cups with beer. Mike and I walked around for a little while and split up after about half an hour. I set up my tip jar at one of the taverns, set up my lute guitar, and started playing songs of the period. The song Wild Rover was a particular favorite throughout the guests, and each tavern I set up at throughout the day somehow inevitably requested that song. It was around noon when Mike and I met up again atop the hill in the far back of the fair. Now, after several cups of beer, I thought it would be wise to switch to water. Remembering that Mike and I had drank the last of ours, I was going to have to go on a small search for water. Hey, Mike, I'm going to go see if I can find some water. I'll be back in a few. Would you mind watching my things? Yeah, sure, no problem. I'll be here, Mike replied. I started to walk a little ways down the hill and saw two reenactors drinking water from their cups. I approached and introduced myself. Good day, sirs. I was curious as to where you had found your water. Good day. My name is Todd and this is James. You must be new around here. You want to walk up this trail. There's a fresh natural spring up there. If you'd like to follow us, we were just about to head back up and get more. One of them said in a rather genuine English accent. Spring? Well, I thought the spring was capped off, I asked, sounding puzzled. Come, sir, tis right this way, James said. The two men started their way up the old dirt trail. I followed. I noticed that the men were talking about events that happened in the late 18th century, as if they were talking about current events. Man, these guys are really dedicated to the bit. I remember thinking to myself. We walked for about ten minutes or so when we came upon a small stone well at the top of a hill. I looked down the shallow well, and indeed there was a fresh stream of water trickling into the well. Guys, I thought this was supposed to be capped off, I said in a concerned tone. Nay, this well is the source of all our water, crops and drinking alike. Just drop your cup into the well and drink plentifully. I did as instructed and dipped my cup into the spring. I lifted the cup to my nose, smelling for any foul odor. The smell was of pure spring water. I did not see any sediment or anything in the cup, so I took a swig of it. The water was cool and had a distinct alkaline taste, pure and crisp. Long travel, sir? James asked. No, not really. Only about a ten-mile journey from home, I replied. The two men looked at each other and Todd scoffed. Ten miles? That's quite a ways. Not really. Only takes about ten minutes to get here. Todd and James once again looked at each other with a puzzled expression. I couldn't help but think that these guys must really need an escape from their home lives to be this dedicated. However, there are a lot of participants that like to stay in character no matter if it's a visitor or another reenactor. Suddenly, I became aware of a cool breeze flowing through the trails. Todd and James bid me good day and soon started walking back to the fair. After a minute or so, I was completely isolated, sitting at the spring. I noticed that I could no longer hear the bustling of the fair and chalked it up to the dense woodland surrounding me. I sat drinking the cool spring water, soon finishing the cup and found myself dipping the cup in once more. All right. It's time to head back, I said to myself as I stood and prepared to walk back down the trail. I started walking down, and about ten minutes in, I realized that I could still not hear the fair. No music, no laughter, nothing. I kept walking and began to feel like something was wrong. I must have taken the wrong turn somewhere. I could have sworn this was the way, I thought to myself. 
Stopping and taking another sip of water from my cup, I felt that strange, cool breeze again. The hair on my arms and neck stood up on end. Something strange was going on here. I walked another five minutes or so and could start to hear faint voices in the distance. I picked up my pace. The trees started to thin out and soon something came into view. It was a wooden wall made of logs. What the hell? I've never seen this before, I said to myself. My stomach started to turn as I had a feeling that something was absolutely wrong. I started to panic a little. I started jogging up and down the log wall and soon found an opening on the opposite side. I took my first look inside this place and my heart dropped. This looked nothing like the fair. I took a few moments to take it all in and something told me that this may indeed be a real settlement. There is no way this is happening. This cannot be real. Maybe I'm dehydrated and seeing things. I slowly started to walk into the settlement. There were many horses, either pulling wooden carts, wagons, or even pulling plows in the garden. The ground was muddy and slick. I heard shouts from children running and playing whilst weaving in and out of small one-room cabins throughout the village. I meandered down the main drag when my eyes locked onto the two gentlemen who had shown me the well. I quickly jogged up to them. Guys, seriously, what's going on? Why, what do you mean? James replied. Okay, seriously, will you drop the act for a minute? Where is the fair? I asked with a slightly irritable tone. They stared at me for a moment. Then Todd spoke. Sam, are you feeling okay? Maybe we should fetch the doctor. James stated. I don't need a goddamn doctor. I want to know what in the hell is going on. At this point, a small crowd of people were starting to gather. The crowd consisted of about seven or eight people. First, may I ask that you temper your language, sir. I fear that you may have a touch of the fever. Come with us and we shall escort you to the doctor. My blood began to boil and I felt my face turning red. I am completely done with you two. Please take me to someone who knows just what is going on around here, I seethed. As you wish, sir, James stated as himself and Todd started walking towards the rear of the village. I stayed quiet as we approached a small cabin in the northwest corner of the village. As we stepped up to the door, James knocked twice. Doctor, we have a man here who would wish to speak to you, James said through the door. One moment. I heard the doctor exclaim inside the cabin. I heard a lot of rustling about and items clanking together. Then with a swift click, the door swung open. Good evening, doctor. Sorry to have bothered you at such a late notice, but we have stumbled across this dear fellow who doesn't seem quite to have his faculties about him. Well then, come on inside. James Todd and I stepped into the small cabin. There was a small fire in the hearth, a long desk, a couple of chairs, a bed, and a small dining table in the opposite corner. The desk had several iron instruments strewn across its surface. What seems to be the problem? Okay, I understand that you guys may be way more into this than I am, but please tell me what's going on. This is part of the fair that I have never seen in my life, and I've been attending this fair for 30-odd years. So please, just drop the act and tell me where I'm at. The doctor looked at me with concern. What do you mean where are you at? You're in the new land called Ohio, the doctor stated with a concerned tone. Yeah, I'm aware of that. Seriously, what part of the fair are you from? The doctor looked over to James and Todd and approached them. There were hushed whispers, and soon after, James and Todd left the cabin. Wait, where are they going? They have other business to attend to. Now, please, sir, may I ask your name? My name is Henry, but look, I just want to know what's going on. Well, Henry, this is a relatively new town. We are just now starting to plow for our crops, the doctor stated. 
I started to feel sick to my stomach because I was slowly realizing that I was not where I was supposed to be, or possibly even when. Okay, doctor. I must not be feeling that great. I even forgot what year it was. Maybe it's the heat. Tis the year of our Lord, 1781. 1781. There is absolutely no way that this can be true. Feigning recollection and attempting to assimilate to their time period, I spoke. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry, doctor. It must have been my fevered mind. Well, Henry, allow me to prepare something for you that will help you settle, the doctor replied. He walked over to a small hutch and started pulling small glass containers out. He grabbed a mortar and pestle and began to add different ingredients into the mortar. The doctor then began to grind the ingredients together and proceeded to put them in a small copper cup. He then walked over to the fire and grabbed a steaming kettle from a swinging hearth hook. The doctor walked back over to the table where he poured hot water into the cup. Grabbing the cup, he walked back over to me. There you are, sir. Drink this. It'll help with the nerves. What is in this? Just a few herbs to help with fever. Helps with nerves as well. All right. Thank you, doctor. I took a sip of the hot concoction. I noticed a strong aroma of mint. There were a few rosemary leaves tossed in, and what I also believe were bits of clove. The mixture was strong, but not too horrible tasting. Now, Mr. Henry, if I may, you seemed quite worked up the moment you arrived. May I ask where you were traveling from? Thinking up a quick story, I explained. Well, I'm from a smaller settlement about ten miles southeast from here. I find that quite interesting. We have been building here since early February, and I do not recall seeing any other settlement before this place here. Must be fairly new. Yes, sir, it is new. My family and I just completed our home, and I was traveling to find food and scout out the land, I said while taking another sip of the drink. I see. And how is it that you've traveled here? I see no horse nor wagon in sight. I walked, sir. So, if I am understanding this correctly, you established a home with your family and came looking for food and scouting out land. Yes, sir. Well, not exact, the doctor interrupted me. With no rifle, no knives or supplies of any kind, the doctor asked with a suspicious look on his face. I started to perspire slightly. I had to dig down and really come up with something to validate my story. Uh, doctor, I actually prefer to trap small game with snares made of sapling wood. I find it the most effective way to ensure a fresh kill every time. I don't need much, maybe some water, and I can forage for berries along the way. I noticed that the doctor's facial expression relaxed a bit, not looking as suspicious. I see. And for that you need nothing? Tell me, Mr. Henry... How would you go about dispatching your catch? Usually, I pin it down if still alive and hit it with a large rock. Once dispatched, I carry it back home where my tools are for preparing my catch. The doctor stared at me for what seemed like twenty seconds or so. Well, then I believe maybe it would be best for you to lie down and get some rest, the doctor said as he slapped his thighs and stood. I don't know if that would be necessary, sir. Judging by what James and Todd told me about your odd behavior in the streets, I believe it may be best for you and all around that you get some rest. You may use this bed over here. There's hot water for tea, and if you require anything else, just say so. I have to pay a visit to someone, and I shall return promptly. The doctor said as he put on his jacket. The doctor opened his door and walked out without saying another word. I took this time to look around a bit in the small cabin. I rifled through a small desk that was sitting next to the hutch. I found several correspondence letters from a variety of other settlements. 
the most prominent one being from Jamestown requesting the doctor's return. I put the letters back where I found them and walked over to the bed. It was made up in the old style, rope bed construction with a mattress made of straw. I sat. I closed my eyes and rubbed my face. This cannot be real. I've got to be dreaming. Maybe if I do sleep a little, I'll wake up. Maybe I passed out or something on the way to the spring, I thought to myself. I laid down on the bed after placing my hat on the small end table. Soon I drifted off to sleep with my mind swirling with possibilities of what could have led me to this particular predicament. I awoke to the door being flung open by the doctor. Following the doctor were two men dressed in full continental military regalia. The two military men walked over to me and started asking questions. Sir, what is your name and where are you from? One of the Continentals said. Hasn't the doctor told you? I replied. Sir, we have scouted out 30 miles or so in every direction. There is not nor ever has been any sign of any other settlement. I don't know what to tell you. That is where I am from, I said as I started to stand. The two men seemed to be slightly startled by my movement and shifted into defensive positions. On behalf of the Continental Army, we are going to have to take you and escort you to another location, the man said. Hold on. Wait a minute. As I started to speak, one of the men grabbed my right arm and started to pull me towards the door. What is going on? I have a right to know, I exclaimed. The man stopped and the other Continental grabbed a hold of my haversack bag and started searching it. We have reason to believe that you may be a spy. We are holding you until proven otherwise. A spy? What? I said. I then realized that they said the year was 1781. The Revolutionary War hadn't ended until 1783. My blood ran cold as I realized that they were truly holding me as a prisoner. What in the devil is this? The man searching my bag exclaimed. The man held up my cell phone. Both men jumped a bit when the screen automatically flicked on. On the background of the phone was a picture of the smiling faces of my wife and daughter. I had noticed that in the top right corner where the signal bar should be read SOS. The man dropped the phone the moment he saw the screen turn on. What type of devil's game is this? Are you mad? The man growled. The phone was lying there on the dirt floor, and soon the screen went back to black. Take him away! Suddenly I was thrust in front of the soldier and pushed out of the doorway and into the streets. The men stopped and tied my arms together with leather straps. Then they placed heavy iron cuffs on my wrists. We began walking towards the center of the village. One soldier in front of me leading the way, I dared not try and struggle because the other soldier behind me had his rifle pushed against my back. We walked into a smaller structure. The structure was dark. The only light permeated through the small cracks in the roof and walls. There was a wooden support pole in the middle of the structure. The Continental soldiers then unbound me, placing my back against the pole and tied my arms together behind the pole. Why are you doing this to me? I asked. You ought not be asking any questions at the moment. Lieutenant Colonel Stacy will be here in a couple of days. You may then plead your case, one of the men said. The two men swiftly walked out of the doorway and shut it. I heard what sounded like a wooden crossbeam slide down and bar the door from the outside. For several hours, I heard nothing but faint yelling of children running around the village. Occasionally, I heard footsteps shuffling towards the door of the structure. I had slid down the post and sat on the dirt and straw-covered floor. I began to sink into a deep state of sorrow as I continued to think about the gravity of the situation that I was in. Before much longer, I heard the wooden bar on the other side of the door lift up and away. The door opened. One of the soldiers who brought me here walked up to me. I'm going to release your shackles momentarily. Any sign of a fight and the other soldier will fire at will. Okay, I said, slightly nodding. The soldier released my shackles and leather bindings. 
I was spun around and he grabbed my arms and reshackled my wrists around the pole so that my arms were no longer behind me. The soldier then produced a small piece of bread and a small metal cup full of water. He placed the bread and cup on the floor at my feet. Just to keep you alive, the soldier said. I said nothing. The soldier then turned and left the building. I heard the wooden bar slide back into place. I sat back down and reached for the bread and took a bite. It was extremely dry, so I lifted the small metal cup and took a sip. I noticed that the metal cup's handle was slightly loose and water was leaking out of one of the holes used to rivet the handle in place. I drank the water until it was below that hole in order to keep the remaining water inside. Evening was slowly approaching and the light emanating through the cracks of the structure started to fade into complete darkness. Before long, I saw another source of light coming through the small cracks in the doorway. Looked like fire the way it was flickering possibly a torch. I began to feel tired and leaned my shoulder and head on the post and fell asleep shortly after. This episode of Drew Blood's Dark Tales is brought to you by HelloFresh. It's the holiday season, friends, and the last thing we've got time for is going to the grocery store. Don't you wish there was someone like Santa Claus who brought farm-fresh, pre-proportioned ingredients and seasonal recipes right to your door? Well, there is. It's HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you can spend this month shopping for gifts and sipping cocoa, not stuck in the checkout line waiting to overpay for groceries. Sign up for HelloFresh and get everything you need to whip up a fresh, tasty meal delivered to your door. Choose your recipes, select a delivery date, and relax, knowing dinner is on the way. Think of the convenience, friends. Most days with all we do, it feels like eating a wholesome dinner is next to impossible. But with HelloFresh, you can turn busy weeknights into memorable meal times with delicious practical options designed to save you time. In a pinch tonight, they've got 15-minute meals for you. HelloFresh is more than just dinners, by the way. You'll be stocked up with easy breakfasts, 10-minute lunches, and snacks both adults and kids will love. Just pop on the HelloFresh market every week, make your selections from their menu, and with their pre-measured ingredients and easy instructions, you'll be cooking up chef-crafted meals around the clock, all without setting foot in a grocery store. That's what I love about HelloFresh. Why stumble around the store worrying about ingredients when I can just choose what I want from the HelloFresh market and let them bring it all the way to my door? Less hassle, less waste, and more time to enjoy the holidays. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. So go to HelloFresh.com slash DrewFree and use code DrewFree for free breakfast for life. One breakfast item per box while subscription is active. That's a free breakfast for life at HelloFresh.com slash DrewFree with the code DrewFree, D-R-E-W-F-R-E-E. Thanks for your support, friends, and for supporting our valuable sponsors. I woke to a loud thump on the door. What are you doing? Stay clear, I say. Someone shouted from outside the door. My arms and shoulder were sore from leaning on that post for what must have been several hours. I was thirsty. I drank what was left in the cup. As I took the last sip, the top portion of the handle came loose. I suddenly came to the realization that I could potentially use this handle to pick the locks on my shackles. I wiggled the handle back and forth for a few minutes until it finally came loose from the cup. I quickly felt around for the lock on my shackles, and upon locating it, I attempted to stick the handle ends into the keyhole. Luckily, they were the old screw-top cuffs. I was able to latch on to something inside the locking mechanism and was able to eventually unlock the cuff to my left arm. I freed myself from the post, trying not to make much noise. I quickly unlocked the right cuff. Have you checked on the prisoner? I heard someone say outside of the door. No sooner than that being said, the wooden bar raised again. 
I quickly shoved the shackles back on my wrists and hid the broken handle under my leg. The door opened. You! Are you still alive? One of the soldiers said. I turned my head slightly to face him. Yeah, I am. Good. We will check on you at first morning light. Guards will be in front of this door all night. The soldier turned and closed the door. I did not hesitate to remove my shackles once again. I knew that I had to come up with a plan. There had to be several hours at least before dawn. I pondered my escape. I was tired, but I managed to keep myself awake and alert. I devised a plan that may possibly just work. I would wait until the first guard came to check on me in the morning, and unbeknownst to him, I will be standing just inside the door as it swings open. I'll attempt to knock him down and make a run for it. I sat for a few more hours and started seeing thin lines of purple light from the rising sun. My heart began to beat faster as I heard footsteps approach the door. I stood up and prepared to run for my life. The wooden bar was removed, and just as they were pulling the door open, I rammed the door. <laughs> It took a considerable amount of force to knock through two of the guards that were standing on the other side. My natural strength combined with adrenaline allowed me to surprise them and knock them over. I began to run. Running as fast as I could, I located the village exit and headed that way. To arms! Find him! I heard one of the soldiers yell. I kept pushing. My feet were hitting the ground harder and faster than ever before. I rounded the village exit, almost running headfirst into two men who appeared to be coming back from a hunt. They had several rabbits hung over their shoulders. Quickly dodging them, I made a break for the woodlands. I kept running until I could no longer hear yelling behind me. My chest was pounding. It felt like a thousand knives stabbing my lungs each time I drew a breath in. I stopped and turned around to look behind me. I saw nothing except trees and bushes. There was a large boulder just to the right of me and I decided to hunker down behind it for a moment to catch my breath. I sat down behind the rock, resting my back on its cool surface. I waited there about ten minutes or so and then stood up. I still did not see anyone behind me. I decided to keep running and changing directions every two hundred yards or so. I must have traveled for at least four to five miles. I slowed my pace to a fast walk, feeling confident that I had eluded the soldiers for the time being. I walked for several more miles until I arrived at a small creek. I started to follow the creek for another mile or so, and then froze in my tracks when I heard what sounded like a voice. I noticed a large fallen tree about ten feet away or so. I began to get down on my hands and knees to crawl toward the tree for cover. Leaning against the tree, I started to hear footsteps swishing through the creek a little farther up ahead. I slowly raised my head above the tree's massive trunk to try and see what was happening. Peering ahead, probably 80 to 90 feet upstream, I saw what looked like a true-blooded Native American. I watched him for several seconds until a large walnut fell off a tree above me and made a loud splashing noise. I saw the native look in my direction, so I ducked down behind the tree again quickly. I heard him yell, then suddenly it sounded as if he were running in my direction. I stood up and started running away from him. He kept yelling and I kept running until I heard this. Wait, friend! I slowed my running down to a walk and looked back. The native was holding his hands up in the air as though he was symbolizing that he was not a threat. I stopped and turned to face him. I allowed the native to walk closer to me, and as he came into focus, I noticed that he looked awfully familiar. Wait, Mike? Is that you? I exclaimed. The native had a confused look on his face. No, name is Red Wolf. Oh, I'm sorry. You look almost identical to one of my friends, I said while still trying to catch my breath. Red Wolf stuck out his right arm like he was going to shake my hand. I reached out and he grabbed the inner part of my forearm closer to my elbow. I matched his gesture. 
Red Wolf shook my arm as I shook his. My name is Henry, I stated. Hmm, Henry. Strong name, Red Wolf replied. I'm sorry if I'm interrupting anything. You see, I was being chased. Chased? By a continental? Red Wolf asked. Yes, how did you know? I asked in return. I see many times strange people come. This area is powerful. Many people get lost. Don't know where to go. I find them. Always here, Red Wolf explained. Many people? So you've seen a lot of people come through here? I asked. Spirit of the trees and earth guide me. I come look and find others. I'm sorry, but how do you know English so well? We do trade with settlers. Crops for weapons. Medicine. Oh, I see. So you know the village back that way? I pointed in the direction that I had come from. Yes, many trade there. Suddenly, piercing the silence of the quiet woods were heavy footfalls and twigs and sticks breaking. Voices of the Continental soldiers rang out. He can't be far. Find him. Bring him back. I looked at Red Wolf with a look of panic. Come, follow, Red Wolf said. Red Wolf began darting through the trees and across the creek. I stayed right on his heels. We ran for what seemed like twenty minutes. Finally, we approached a small Native American village. There were huts made of branches and tree bark, teepees and several thatch roof clay homes. As we entered the village, Red Wolf instructed me to go into one of the huts. I crawled inside first and Red Wolf after. You stay. I go out to meet Continentals, Red Wolf said. Okay, I replied. Approximately fifteen minutes went by, and then I started to hear the yelling of the Continental soldiers entering the village. I heard murmured conversation. The conversing lasted for about five minutes, and then I heard what sounded like the soldiers heading back in the direction that they had come. Shortly after that, Red Wolf entered the hut. Are they gone? I asked. Yes. I tell them no stranger here. We say never saw anyone. A long sigh of relief exited my lungs. Thank God. I thought I was about to get captured again. No. They trust us. We teach how to grow food. All right, then. So, may I ask you a question? Yes. So, back there in the woods, you were saying that many people come through here. What exactly did you mean by that? Other settlers? Red Wolf thought about his answer for a moment. No. People like you. Like me. What do you mean? People from a different land. I have seen many. I have helped many. Many lose their way. I go to help. Strange power comes from the river. I thought about this answer for a moment or two. How do you know to help them? I see the look on their face. It's a look of fear and loss. Somehow I know I am meant to help. You see, all creatures are connected. The trees, the water, the wind, all share the same spirit. So did you know I was out there? What were you doing there so far from your village? I felt a shift in the winds and knew something was happening. I follow my inner guide. The wolf. Red Wolf grabbed the talisman that he wore around his neck. It was a carving of a wolf's head crafted from bone. He looked at it by the light of the small fire in the hut, as though he were lost in deep thought. So you knew I was out there? I did not know for sure. I just knew to keep walking. I was guided by the spirits. Then I saw you. When I saw you close, 
I felt you were connected in some way. I knew I had to help. I took a moment to take all this in. Red Wolf stoked the fire a bit, causing the flames to rise a little higher. The walls of the hut came into light with various animal skins hung on them. Antlers and hooves lined the top of the walls. A small crude table was on the far opposite side of the hut. Atop the table were several knives, arrows, and spearheads. I looked back over to Red Wolf. So you said you have helped people in the past. How did you help them? I showed them their way. Some did fail. Some made it home. Are you able to help me get back home? Only if you listen to your heart. Accept the spirits of the land. They will lead you home if you listen, Red Wolf stated. How do I do that? Time for rest, friend. You will sleep now. Red Wolf unrolled the deer pelt on the far side of the hut and instructed me to lay down. He handed me a hollowed-out gourd filled with water. Drink now. Sleep, Red Wolf said. I did as he instructed. I drank plentifully from the gourd, then set it down next to me. I laid down and let the exhaustion envelop me. I soon fell asleep while listening to the crackle of the fire. The morning soon arrived and Red Wolf was shaking my shoulder. Time to rise. We must go. Uh, go where? Remains to be seen. Red Wolf walked over and grabbed a few arrows in his longbow. He had slung a deerskin quiver upon his back and motioned towards the door of the hut. I slowly stood and stretched. That was probably the best sleep I've had in a while, and to that fact I was surprised due to the circumstance that I currently found myself in. I walked out of the hut into the bright morning sun. I looked up to see the green leaves from the long tree branches. It seemed as though the trees were surrounding us and protecting us from anything else. Come, this way, Red Wolf said. I followed him out into the dense woodland. We walked for a while and soon we found ourselves back at the very creek we had met. I show you our way, Red Wolf said. He held his right index finger up to his mouth, signaling me to stay quiet. Then he put his hand lower towards the ground with the palm facing down, indicating that he wanted me to stay where I was. He then started creeping forward silently as he withdrew the bow from his back and an arrow from the quiver. Red Wolf kept walking forward slowly and lowered himself to a half-crouching position. I watched silently as he drew back the bow. I tried to see what he was aiming at. However, I could not see anything. With a sudden swish, the arrow was released from the bow at lightning speed. Red Wolf stood there for a moment and then signaled me to follow. We trampled through knee-high vegetation and around several trees. Red Wolf stopped about ten feet in front of me and looked down. I walked up next to him to find an eight-point buck lying on the ground with an arrow dug deep into its chest cavity. I watched as Red Wolf bent down and closed the eyes of the animal. I believe he said some type of prayer in his native language, then stood and looked at me. We thank spirits of the earth and release spirit of the deer, thanking for its sacrifice to keep us nourished, begin as part of the earth, end as part of the earth. This was a humbling moment. The love and care that these natives have for the earth and all the creatures upon it. Red Wolf pulled his arrow from the deer. He had shot and killed the deer from at least fifty yards away with one swift deadly shot. I was amazed at his accuracy. He then began making incisions with the arrow across the belly of the deer. He skillfully cleaned the deer and then tied a rope to all four legs bringing them together. I watched as he angled himself in such a way to hoist the deer upon his shoulders. I followed him back to his village in silence. Arriving at the village, he met up with some of the other natives that helped butcher the deer. 
and they soon had meat hung on sticks over the fire. Red Wolf introduced me to several other tribe mates. I stood and listened to their stories of experiences they had with other settlers, some good and some not so great, tales of some skirmishes with other settlements that forced them to move to where they are now. Red Wolf took me back out to a different part of the woodlands and showed me how to use his longbow. I shot off a few arrows and soon felt that I had a decent handle on using the bow. Now focus. Deep breath. Breathe. Release. I took a deep breath and fired my final arrow. The arrow struck a tree and fell instantly to the ground. Upon inspection, the tip of the arrow had shattered. There was a distinct pattern of red flint that was striped through the arrow. Arrow broke. Not good for hunting. Come, we must get back. Red Wolf and I started walking back to the village. The day was slowly fading to dusk when we arrived back. The tribe were dancing around the fire, beating drums and singing their ancestral songs. What are they singing about? Giving thanks for food. Thanking the spirits that connect us all. Oh, I see. Red Wolf and I approached the ceremony. He joined in the ceremony as I took a place sitting on a nearby log. I sat and watched as they danced and played music around the fire. The dance continued for about 20 minutes. I was entranced at the sight. They all seemed so spiritual and intentional in their actions, their steps, their every movement. Soon after the music ended, the tribe started harvesting the meat off the fire and handing it to each other. Red Wolf grabbed two softball-sized pieces of meat and started walking my way. Eat for nourishment, Red Wolf said as he sat down on the log next to me. Without hesitation, I grabbed the venison and took a large bite. The meat was juicy and flavorful. The juice ran down my chin as I continued to devour the food. Juice is covering my hands and lap as I shoved the last bite into my mouth. After I finished chewing, I looked over at Red Wolf. He was halfway done with his food. He noticed me staring at him. Only a fool eats fast on an empty stomach. I laughed. Oh yeah? You should see some of the heavily processed foods that I... I stopped speaking because I realized that he would have no idea as to what I was talking about. Red Wolf just smiled and resumed eating his food. I noticed that after most of the tribe was done eating, they gathered around the fire. There were people talking about their day and how good the food was. Once Red Wolf had finished, he rinsed his hands with a tiny bit of water from his gourd canteen. He then took a sip of the water and offered the canteen to me. I took the canteen and took a long swallow of cool water. Thank you, I said. Red Wolf nodded. When do you think you will be going back to the village that was chasing me? I do not know. Well, I was just asking because they still have my bag. I have personal belongings in that bag that are important to me, so I'd like to retrieve them. We go now, Red Wolf said. Now? Like, right now? It's dark. Won't we get lost? Red Wolf just smiled and chuckled as he rose to his feet. <laughs> Come, we go. I stood up and started to follow him out of his village. As we walked by the rest of the tribe, one older man stepped in my path. Yankuna, Usun, Pasana Pataki, the old man said as he waved a stick in front of me. He then pushed his finger into a red substance and brushed it over my right eye. For a safe passage, village healer, Red Wolf said. I looked at the old man and nodded a sign of appreciation. The man nodded back and stepped out of my way. We go now, Red Wolf said. I followed Red Wolf out into the dark woodland. We walked for about an hour, and I noticed that the moon was especially bright out. The moon and stars were brighter than I'd ever seen. This made it a lot easier to see where we were going.
we met up with the creek and followed for what seemed like miles. Red Wolf then took a hard right back into the dense woodland. We kept traveling in that direction for quite some time until I started seeing a faint light in the distance through the trees. Red Wolf stopped. Settlers, he said in a hushed tone. What do we do now? Stay quiet. Follow. Red Wolf started creeping towards the settlement as I followed in his very footsteps. Soon we reached that old familiar log wall that I had seen when first stumbling upon the settlement. Red Wolf stayed close to the wall as we crept around to the back of the settlement. We continued about twenty feet or so and stopped. We go here, Red Wolf said as he pointed to a small opening in between one of the logs. The opening was just big enough for a man to squeeze through. I go first. Then I tell you when you go, he said quietly. Okay, I whispered. Red Wolf stuck his head into the opening and looked around, then squeezed his body through and disappeared from view. I quickly shuffled up to the opening and saw Red Wolf with his back leaning against one of the cabins. He took another look around and then looked back at me. He signaled for me to enter. I squeezed through the opening and met him alongside the cabin. We crept to the corner of the cabin and Red Wolf stopped to peer around the corner. He quickly pulled his head back and flattened his back against the cabin. I followed suit. I started to hear voices and footsteps. The door to the cabin opened and someone walked inside. We heard the door close. Red Wolf looked around the corner a second time. He signaled me to follow him. We rushed across the alleyway that was half lit by a torch on the outside of one of the cabins. We ducked into a small, dark, three-foot-wide space that was in between a cabin and the settlement wall. Red Wolf and I began crawling quietly to the other end of the cabin. Red Wolf looked around the corner of this cabin, finding the coast was clear. We slinked down to the other side of the cabin and noticed a small window on this side. Red Wolf peered inside. We here, he whispered. I stood up to look into the window. Sure enough, it was the doctor's cabin. I did not see anyone inside. I looked around the cabin interior and spied my haversack bag on the doctor's desk. Yeah, there it is. How do we get inside? Red Wolf started to push softly on the window, and it started to open from the side on a swivel. I looked at Red Wolf and he had his hands clasped together, palms up, and nodded at me. I put my foot in his hands and he hoisted me up through the window. I carefully navigated myself through the window and over the bed that was just below me. Once fully inside, I walked over to my haversack bag. Upon inspection, everything seemed to be there except for my phone. I began looking everywhere in the cabin and finally came to the desk drawer. Upon opening the drawer, there sat my phone. I grabbed the phone and tossed it into my haversack and quickly jaunted back to the window, picking up my tricorn hat along the way. As I was lowering myself down outside the window, I heard the door open to the doctor's cabin. Laughter was heard as he bid another person good night. I finished lowering myself and then stood and peeked through the window. The doctor was stumbling around his cabin clearly intoxicated. He looked in my direction and I ducked down and laid in the dark shadows. Red Wolf and I held our breath for several moments. Suddenly we heard the window moving. I don't recall having opened this, the doctor said with slurred speech. The doctor then began chuckling to himself as we heard the window close in a loud against the cabin wall. Red Wolf and I waited there for a good five minutes or so, and finally heard snoring coming from within the cabin. I stood back up and peered back into the cabin one last time. The doctor had fallen into his bed and passed out due to his drunken state. Red Wolf signaled for me to follow him back to the opening in the wall. We crept back the same way we came, avoiding as much light as we could and making little noise. We both managed to squeeze back through the opening and free ourselves from the settlement.
Red Wolf and I started making our way back through the woodland on the very same trail that had led me here. We walked the uphill trail for about ten minutes and came upon a familiar sight, the old spring. The dawn had started breaking and golden rays of light mixed with reds, pinks, and blues spread throughout the treetops. You go home, Red Wolf said. How? How do I get back? Red Wolf pointed at the spring. Drink. I pulled out the old tin cup from my haversack and bent over to fill the cup. I stopped before it touched the water and stood back up. Why wait? Red Wolf asked with a confused look on his face. I'm not really sure. I just feel like maybe I'll never see you again. We are all connected. You will see me in the next life, Red Wolf replied. I walked over to him and extended my right arm just as he did when we first met. Red Wolf looked and grabbed my forearm in a fierce grip. He smiled and with his other hand he patted my right shoulder. I'll see you again, friend. He then motioned toward the spring and turned. Red Wolf started walking back through the dense woodland. I stood and watched him disappear into the trees. Smiling, I bent over and filled my cup. I raised the cup as kind of a cheers to Red Wolf. I closed my eyes and took a long drink. I thought about how everything is connected, how the rivers, trees, and earth all have a spirit. I thought about how we should all remember this and have the same respect for everything as they did. Moments later, I felt the cool breeze rush up onto me through the trees. I opened my eyes. I noticed the sun was a little higher in the sky than before. It appeared to be around noon. I started hearing faint music from guitars and bagpipes. The distinct aromas of food and campfire. I poured the rest of the water out of my cup back into the spring. Walking back down the pathway, the music became louder and the scents more prominent. A couple of minutes later, I found myself walking into a large opening with many canvas tents. People walking around with modern clothing and taking pictures. I'm back, I whispered to myself. I was curious, though, of the fact that I had just spent several days in the past. So how did I end up right back here? I remember sweeping the thought away because it didn't matter. I was home. The instant relief of being home again swept over me like a heated blanket on a cold night. I looked to my left toward the tavern at the top of the hill and noticed my friend Mike still sitting there where I had left him. I started walking towards him and stopped dead in my tracks as I saw two men dressed in continental uniforms walk by with rifles on their shoulders. The two men kept walking and looked at me, nodded their heads, and kept walking away. It took me a second to realize that I was holding my breath. I released my breath and continued walking up the hill. Hey, man, your stuff is all safe and sound, Mike said. I looked down at my lute guitar and stared for a moment. You okay, man? Mike asked me, snapping me out of my trance. Yeah, man, I'm good. I think that scotch egg must have messed with me. I think I'm going to gather my things and head back to the tent for a while. Also, sorry that I was gone so long. It's no problem. You weren't gone but about ten minutes. But you go take care of yourself. You sure you're okay? Yeah, I'm good. I just think I need to lie down for a while. I collected my items and started heading back to camp. I felt even more relief when I saw all of my creature comforts still waiting for me in my tent. I opened one of the coolers and saw an ice-cold beer. I grabbed the beer and popped it open. The fizz and smell of the beer was heavenly to me. Man, I needed this, I said to myself. Taking the first few sips of beer, I set it on an old wooden chest next to my bedroll. I decided to lay down and sleep for a while. I laid on my back and placed my tricorn hat over my face. I fell asleep almost immediately. I woke up because Mike was calling my name from outside the tent. Hey, Henry, 
You good? Yeah, much better. I needed that. I stood up and stretched. Unfastening the flaps of my tent, I saw Mike stoking the fire. The twilight of dusk was once again descending on the park. Grabbing my unfinished beer, I walked out of the tent and over to a stump that I had used for a chair and sat down. You missed out on most of the fun today, man. I chuckled. I had plenty of fun. Trust me. Okay. Sleeping? Mike said, puzzled. Once again, I just chuckled. Mike shook his head and went back to stoking the fire. I sat and listened since the music had faded and heard the wind rustle in the treetops. I thought of Red Wolf and how he had taught me so much. Mike had thrown a couple beer brats on the gridirons over the fire. It reminded me of the venison and how good it was. Hey, Mike, I said. Yeah? I think maybe in the morning I may pack up my things. I think I've had enough of this weekend. I kind of miss my family. What? It's only been two days. Only one day left. We look forward to this every year. Listen, man, I'm not saying that you have to leave. I can always come back Monday and pick you up. Well, okay then, if that's what you want to do. I'm not going to miss the rest of the fair, though. I understand. We sat by the fire, watched the brats as they sizzled. We ate the brats once they were done cooking, and shortly after, we turned in for the night. I slept like a rock. The morning came within minutes, it seemed. I woke myself up with a cup of coffee that Mike had percolated in a pot over the fire. You sure you want to leave? Mike asked. Yeah, I'm sure. All right, man. Well, I'm going to head back out to the fair. I'll see you Monday. See you Monday, man. I started packing my things into various containers and deconstructed my tent. It took me about an hour and a half to trek everything out to the car, several trips just on my own. I sat behind the wheel of my car and laughed. If I only had this car with me, I wonder what Red Wolf would have thought then, I said, chuckling to myself. I shifted the car into drive and started my journey home. Fifteen minutes later, I was pulling into my driveway. I shifted the car into park and climbed out. My wife met me halfway up the sidewalk. What are you doing home? I thought you weren't supposed to be back until Monday. My wife asked. I guess I just missed my family. I gave her a kiss and walked into the house where my daughter greeted me. I reached down and picked her up and squeezed her in a tight hug. Moments later, my wife came back inside. Since you're home, you mind if I run out and get a case of water? You took most of ours, my wife said. Yeah, that's fine. What's so funny? Nothing, babe. Just glad to be home. Well, I'll be back in a few. I walked over to the refrigerator and opened it. One last bottle of water. I grabbed the water and twisted the cap off. I guess I should be more careful where I get my water, I said. I closed my eyes and took a drink. And that was Colonial Rift by Corey Adrian. A good reminder to invest in a little water filtration. Just in case, you know. A little about the author. Corey Adrian, born a couple hundred years too late, can install your cable, serenade you with a loot, or for the right price, do both in no particular order. When he's not putting pen to paper, you might find him at your local Colonial Reenactment Fair. He enjoys restoring antique radios, woodworking, and all things creepypasta. He's got a beautiful wife, a daughter, and a stepson whose support made these stories possible. You can find them on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Corey.Adrian.3, the number three. Thanks, Corey. And do me a favor, would you? Subscribe to this podcast wherever you do your listening and leave me a five-star review and a kind word, even if you're listening on YouTube. I need soldiers on all fronts to win this battle, and I appreciate it. 
to hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillintellsdarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive, all ad-free and available to download or stream. Thank you for your time and for supporting our sponsors. When you support our sponsors, you support this show. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all our latest updates and new releases, and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook. And we're accepting submissions, friend. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on this show, send it to DrewBloodHorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full treatment. Ten Bananas. Well, I'm afraid this is where we part ways. At least till next week. So grab some lard for the road, friend. You'll burn it off on your walk, don't worry. And here's to your health. I'd like to say hi and give a big welcome to some of my newest patrons. So, Louise Anthony Maney, Charlie Jones, 1861, Kathleen Brundage, Roger Stallings, Kyra, and Caitlin. Hello, friends. Thanks for becoming patrons, y'all. It means a lot to me. And if anyone else is interested in supporting me and what I do, go to patreon.com forward slash Drew Blood and sign up to become a patron. Any little bit helps, y'all. And I thank you. So, Louise Anthony Maney, Charlie Jones, 1861, Kathleen Brundage, Roger Stallings, Kyra, and Caitlin. May the wind be at your back, and may the road rise up to meet you. See you next week, and by all means, go fuck yourselves. <laughs> Good night, friends. Hey, you all right over there, Dingle? Dingle? Well, goddamn. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.